what I've seen with Rajiv's work over the years, which I think is exemplary, uh, the development of a position and a attitude toward the problem of cross-cultural, inter-philosophical learning uh, with the mindfulness of the long and tortured history, uh, history of India and the West. And it, in some of the work I would say had been very particular to persons, you might say ad hominem, about individuals and their projects, uh, individuals and the kinds of issues they're doing and, and getting into the, the nitty gritty of fighting with individuals. But it seems that uh, being a very intelligent and thoughtful person, Rajiv, has realized that the individuals ourselves are are parts of a larger machinery that we are not really in charge of. That there are these larger pattern, patterns and systems of learning that may sound very intellectual and sound very um, a matter of scholarship, but they're often products in part of economics, of politics, of larger, larger you might say, geopolitical movements going on in which any individual, even ones that think of themselves as most important, are merely a part. And so I think with Snakes in the Ganga is a very clear sense here of how things are changing and to see the larger patterns of who's in charge, where the money is, where the power is, and what do we do about this. Okay, um, so let me begin, first of all, Balram, by expressing my gratitude to your arranging this event and inviting me to be part of it. So as you said, we've known each other a good number of years now, and we've always had a good relationship, and I'm happy to participate in an event you have arranged. And I'm grateful to uh, Rajiv and his co-author, Vijaya Vishwanathan, for putting this very provocative book together. Uh, I think it's a book worthy of discussion, will compel discussion among many people, and um, I'm happy to be here tonight. But I wanted to be here because um, over the years, I have respected the kind of work that Rajiv does. And uh, we certainly do not always agree on everything, and that may, may or may not be the case tonight. But I think I've always been able to learn from his work. And I think it fills a real need in terms of thinking about how to balance the playing field, how to bring about a dialogue and a conversation in which it's not Western academics doing the talking, and people in Asia or other parts of the world, or particularly South Asia, India, doing the listening, but rather a back and forth conversation. And so as Balram mentioned, the book Being Different, we had a memorable event down in South Dartmouth. I don't know how many years ago that was now, but a, a memorable event up on the stage, uh, talking to one another. I, I'm not allowed to go into my office, so I was going to pull off the shelf uh, several of the books I do have, uh, The Battle for Sanskrit, Breaking India, and now the biggest of them all, I think, Snakes in the Ganga, uh, this very large book, which I had originally been optimistic and said I would bring with me on my plane trip last week, but they probably wouldn't have let it through security thinking it was a weapon of some sort. So I had to um, leave it home when I traveled last week. But I, I think if I could say in general, and we can come back to this if it's relevant later, what I've seen with Rajiv's work over the years, which I think is exemplary, uh, the development of a position and a attitude toward the problem of cross-cultural, inter-philosophical learning uh, with the mindfulness of the long and tortured history, uh, history of India and the West. And it, in some of the work I would say had been very particular to persons, you might say ad hominem, about individuals and their projects, uh, individuals and the kinds of issues they're doing and, and getting into the, the nitty gritty of fighting with individuals. But it seems that uh, being a very intelligent and thoughtful person, Rajiv, has realized that the individuals ourselves are, are parts of a larger machinery that we are not really in charge of. That there are these larger pattern, patterns and systems of learning that may sound very intellectual and sound very um, a matter of scholarship, but they're often products in part of economics, of politics, of larger, larger you might say, geopolitical movements going on in which any individual, even ones that think of themselves as most important, are merely a part. And so I think with snakes in the Ganga is a very clear sense here of how things are changing and to see the larger patterns of who's in charge, 
where the money is, where the power is, and what do we do about this? And I'll, I'll come back to this several times over in, in what I uh, say in the following. Um, I, I was you know, looking through the book, and I think you all have copies of the book at this point and have at least perused the table of contents, that very much uh, a key part of the book has to do with Harvard University, which is not an atypical move because often when people want to take on a university and spend a lot of time and study about a particular university, it might as well be Harvard. Um, it's big, it's wealthy, it's old, um, and has an incredible cast of characters around the campus. And so the, the second part of the book, the, the Harvard Vishwa Guru and Indian Billionaires, is quite an impressive achievement in itself, uh, you know, sections on, on the history of Harvard and the history of Harvard and Asia, Harvard and India, uh, the well-known Kum Mela project, uh, so where uh, a consultant scholars and students Kum Mela and, and studied it, were participants in it to some extent, and wrote about it from various critical attitudes. Uh, institutes at Harvard, the Mahindra Humanities Center, the South Asia Institute, all of these are put under the microscope in this book at various points. Uh, the Kennedy School of Government, the School of Public Health, the Business School, in many of which institutions there are many influential uh, figures from South Asia, including deans at various points. Uh, but all of this is kind of looked at with intensity and closeness by Rajiv and Vijaya in their book. And I think that's perfectly fine. And Harvard is, is, if anything, a public institution and is studying everyone everywhere. So it might as well be studied by people everywhere as well. Um, <clears throat> many of these, believe it or not, I've been at Harvard uh, since 2005. And many of these uh, aspects of Harvard that are under study here in the book, I, don't, I haven't actually had much contact with. And I'll explain why in a moment. But the the Humanities Center, the South Asia Institute, cursory relationships now and then, this relation, that relationship, uh, hardly anything with the Kennedy School or public health, and really nothing with the business school. So there are different Harvards, and the, and the Harvard that was under the spotlight in this book is really not the Harvard in which I participated in these nearly 20 years. Uh, the book doesn't talk about the part that I'm in. Uh, so the Divinity School, uh, which was founded um, 1814, 1816, the first major part of Harvard outside Harvard Yard on Divinity Avenue. You can go see the original building, 1830 or so on Div, Div Avenue. Uh, the Center for the Study of World Religions at the Divinity School. Um, Rajiv does mention John Carmen and conversations with John Carmen, but the center, which goes back to 1960 and was dedicated to interreligious learning, it was inaugurated on its first day by Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Radhakrishnan, um, who came from Oxford. I think this was before he was president of India. I'm not sure on the dates, but nonetheless came and was the auspicious first day speaker at, at the Center for the Study of World Religions, or even the, the one part of arts and sciences that really um, does pertain to the study of religion in a more dedicated fashion, the Committee on the Study of Religion which I, as a faculty member of the Divinity School, am part of, this is where we train the doctoral students in religion, in theology, in Hindu studies, Buddhist studies, Islamic studies, and so on. All of these are in the Committee on the Study of Religion. And this too doesn't appear in the book, uh, which I thought was an interesting move. And indeed, even the South Asian Department, the South Asian Studies Department, which was the old Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies, which I believe went back to the 19th century, with a name, something like that, doesn't figure prominently per se as a department of the university in the book. So in some ways it gives me, who am a faculty member of the Divinity School, who was for seven years director of the center and who is a, a member of the Committee and Study of Religion, it gives me an odd vantage point of being an insider to Harvard all these years and yet not under the microscope in the book directly. So I'm both able to, to speak as an insider, but without feeling myself needing to be defensive um, in, in course of what I do. There, there are many particular things said about these different programs that I've mentioned, uh, South Asia Institute, Humanities Center, and so on like that, that I will, I will not talk about at all, because I think uh, not having done a lot of research on those aspects of Harvard, I would prefer not to get 
directly involved in pro or con and, and leave it to the individuals who are written about in the book or the, the programs that are written about the book to, to give their response and put in writing what they think of what Rajiv is having to say. But I'd like to speak from my own perspective about all of this. And, and part of this, uh, then I'd like to just remind you and a little build a little bit on what Balram was saying about what it is that I do. And so back to my um, youth, uh, it's 49 years since I first went to South Asia. I went to Kathmandu, Nepal, right after college, 1973, and um, fell in love with Hinduism immediately. Uh, even though the Hinduism of the Kathmandu Valley is a, certainly a hybrid mixture, uh, unlike that of the major parts of India and South India, where I ended up doing a good bit of my work, immediately was intrigued by the temples, uh, Pashupatinath, Dakshin Kali, other beautiful places there in the Himalayas, and it became a part of my life that has never uh, stepped outside of my life. When I got to graduate school, University of Chicago, 1979, in the South Asian Languages and Civilizations Department, uh, A.K. Ramanujan was the chair of the department at that point, and um, I think many of you would know his name. I did what I do best, which is the study of texts and commentaries, uh, Purva Mimamsa and Advaita Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta among the darshanas, and then, as Balram mentioned, I got involved in Tamil studies. And no, I do not speak Tamil fluently. And I don't even write in Tamil fluently, but I can read medieval Tamil. Um, so that's one thing I can do. And, and reading the Divya Prabandham, the works of the Alvars, uh, particularly Namalvar, later figures like Manavala Mamunigal, uh, Vedanta Deshika, and so on, loving to read these texts and endlessly learning from them uh, has been part of my life. Um, <clears throat> And, and much of what I have to do has to do with reading and seeing what you find when you read, uh, studying and see what comes out of your study. So my one of my more recent uh, larger books is called Reading the Hindu and Christian Classics, How and Why Deep Learning Still Matters, and saying there's no political frame or economic frame or um, frame of correctness or whatever that replaces actual study and learning, either in the traditions of India itself, studying with gurus and pundits, or studying in some other way, such as the Roman Catholic tradition to which I belong, but you've got to read, you've got to study, you've got to learn. I also did book a recently a little book, just to give you a flavor, called St. Joseph in South India. So St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, an 18th century Jesuit missionary wrote an epic poem called Tembavani about uh, St. Joseph and told the entire Christian story in glorious high Tamil. And I translated maybe 300 verses of it in the course of this theological study. I'm doing other translations of Tamil at the moment and I'm actually uh, writing a memoir about my 50 years of the study of Hinduism, comparative study and so on. When I teach here at Harvard and just to, again, fill in a little more background, I try to do courses that I think deal with some of the issues that are of concern to Rajiv and, and uh, Vishwa and their project, uh, sorry, Vijaya and their project. Um, courses that try to balance the playing field. On the one hand, courses that um, are informational, but go somewhat deep. So I do regular courses at the uh, seminar level on Bhagavad Gita uh, with the commentary of Madhusudana Saraswati, the great Vedantin in Shankara's tradition, who nonetheless tried to include uh, Bhakti, uh, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad with Shankara's commentary, uh, Yoga Sutras with uh, Vyasa's original commentary, of course, but also Hari Harananda, uh, the great um, 20th century ascetic scholar of Yoga Sutras, getting students to step away from their preconceptions about what Vedanta is, what yoga is, and so on, and just study the text. and. Students are often bored at first and say, well, we can't spend the whole semester on one book, can we? And then by the 10th week or so, they're saying, we need a whole year. We, we can't possibly do this in one semester. And so getting immersed. I do comparative courses, courses with titles such as Krishna and Christ, Hindu goddesses and the Virgin Mary. Um, and of course, I'm doing right now, who needs God, question mark, in which we're reading some Vedic texts and some biblical texts. Uh, the Medieval Christian Classic Journey of the Mind to God by St. Bonaventure, 
along with the Soundarya Lahari, the ocean of beauty attributed to Shankara, uh, reading uh, Sri Ramakrishna this week, along with Therese of Lisieux, who is a saint of the Catholic Church from the same time period. And we'll conclude uh, in, in the next weeks by reading Mahatma Gandhi, how he found God in his own life, and Dorothy Day, the great kind of activist, nonviolent thinker uh, who had great esteem for, for Gandhi. I'm also, interestingly, and I think this relates to the core issues in, in the book, uh, I'm doing, of course, Introduction to Hindu Spiritual Care, which I would not dare to do it by myself, but Swami Tyagananda, the Ramakrishna Swami here in Boston, he and I are old friends. We met first in Chennai about 30 years ago. And we're team teaching, of course, for the second time on introduction to spiritual care, ministry, chaplaincy from a Hindu perspective. Uh, just as in the divinity school, we have uh, chaplaincy, ministry in the Christian perspective, the Jewish perspective, the Buddhist perspective, wanting Hinduism to be taken up in this practical fashion. And again, I wouldn't do that course alone, but doing with Swami Tyagananda, I think, works. Um, I won't go on much more about my background, except uh, to confirm what Balram said. I believe in spiritual practice. Um, so I am a Catholic, Catholic priest. I have a parish on the weekend. I go say mass in the parish. Um, as a Jesuit, as you may know, the Jesuits were founded in 1540, St. Ignatius Loyola. And in 1542, Francis Xavier went off to India. And so right from the beginning of the Society of Jesus, there has been an India connection. Today, as you probably know, um, there are Jesuits all over India, and the largest number of Jesuits in the world is in India. Um, so there's a long connection there, and I love to visit, um, but I think I'm just part of a much longer history. We also are trying to develop at Harvard Divinity School a Hindu monastics program. Um, because there is a Buddhist monastics program, and we've had two, two cohorts of uh, three and then two Buddhist uh, Hindu monastics, uh, Ramakrishna tradition, Chinmaya tradition, and Swami Narayan tradition, <clears throat> spending a year at Harvard's expense at the Divinity School, taking courses, doing other things, and so on. If we can find more funding, we hope to continue that in the future. And then uh, Swami Tyagananda and I will be speaking this, this weekend here in, in, in uh, over at Tufts University is the North American Hindu Chaplaincy Association meeting. And um, uh, we'll both be speaking about, our, about the course there. I put all this in, in context so that I can now turn to the book and just say a few things about what I think about the book itself. So sorry for that long lead up. But when I, when I turn to the book, I, what I like about it, I think, in particular is that, again, uh, taking up large issues, that what Rajiv and Vijay are getting into is what I would call you know, the dynamics and the workings of modern secular academe. And modern secular academe, which is not a dirty word, it's not a dirty word to be secular or to be an academic, nor does that say anything about the individual faith commitments, if any, of individuals who are in secular programs. But nonetheless, there's a, a certain kind of academe that I think the book is really going after uh, that specializes in critique of all structures of privilege while privileging itself with the right to decide which ones deserve to be critiqued. Um, and often not one's own structures, but their structures. Uh, a secular approach to all topics even religion that doesn't respect, I would say, in any strong or meaningful way, tradition or how traditions are continuous over a very long time and have a basis in very ancient experience, very ancient um, seers and teachers. Uh, the reality of the transcendent is often turned into best a metaphor uh, that talking about realities beyond the five senses, beyond the material world, is also downgrade is often downgraded and considered to be unimportant because what's really going on are power structures, hierarchies, privileges, hegemonies, and so on like that. That the transcendent disappears, and all that some scholars can seem to see left would be what is secular or material. Um, it, often in that kind of study, there is little room for things like a divinity school, or for the study of religion as a discipline that takes religion seriously. And I, I think these are common features, which again are not evil, 
But if they become dominant in the way a, a part of the world is significant as South Asia is studied, it means that tradition may be dismissed, the transcendent may be dismissed, the spiritual may be dismissed, and what left is going to be reduced too often to these structures of power and competition. And the point is then to uncover them and to push back against them from the um, vantage point of a place like Harvard. So a materialist critique, I mean, uh, the book uses terminology of Marxism. And I think that's quite right in terms of uh, a Marxist critique, which again in itself, Marxism needn't be a dirty word, but if it's a reductive term that reduces religion and the spiritual to Marxist critique, then it, it's simply partial and even to a large extent clueless. It doesn't know what it's talking about. So I think what the book you know, tries to do, and I think with some convince, convincing prospects to it, um, is talk about the, the, the results of the secular study of India and the secular study of Hindu traditions that brings in extrinsic critiques from American issues, American concerns about race and power and gender, and applies them to India, often extrinsically, not from an Indian perspective and not with a sufficient, I would think, sensitivity to the Indian context, but rather with looking at them through the eyes of the modern materialistic culture in which we live. Um, and I think part of what the book does very well is open up a perspective on saying, this is a crazy way to study South Asia. This is a crazy way to study one of the richest religious areas of the world to leave out everything that's transcendent or spiritual and somehow try to do it without that it can be extremely reductive. I would say is, this isn't simply, of course, about South Asia. Um, I think one could go on and talk about how in modern universities, contemporary universities such as Harvard University, uh, there is in general a decline of the humanities. Uh, the humanities are under stress. Uh, the number of majors has gone down. Universities lose interest in the humanities and cut back on faculty. Uh, departments become smaller, whereas the sciences, engineering, communications, business are often growing. And I think, well, this, you know, is, is no university is, is out to destroy the humanities, I don't think. But I think in some ways, the, the value system of secular universities could, in some cases, lead itself to the point of saying, we don't know why we have the humanities, whereas we can talk about power, money, and other issues more easily, so let's do that. And I think uh, the, the book is a grand case study of that going on. Um, so Snakes in the Ganga, uh, a massive book, a book that has a lot to go, you know, going for it. I did not have the time nor the good health this past week to go through it thoroughly. I did look at it endlessly in different spots, enjoying it. And I settled just for one example, and then I'll be done fairly quickly, um, with chapter six, a response, history of Indian social organization uh, in the face of the application of critical race theory to caste and so on, which had been done in the previous section. And the reason I focus on this chapter is because I think it's very important. And also I think it, it perhaps shows the book at its best light, a book that raises a series of issues Almost all the issues could be taken up more deeply. Uh, of course, that's the nature of any uh, overview study like this. But nonetheless, raising a series of issues in a trenchant fashion, and particularly raising issues related to uh, race theory and caste, racism and casteism. And I, I think we all agree that there's something important going on when we, because we know about the horrible abuses under uh, racist regimes and the incredible suffering of people of color in every part of the world. And we know we read in the papers and all that stories about horrible instances in certain Indian villages, whatever, where people are you know, killed, tortured to death, harassed because of their caste identity. And I think what I say is not to take away from the fact that there are terrible abuses that we should be able to call out. But nonetheless, I think the book is more subtle than that in talking about the 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 tendency, the um, the disposition to go to the ism, racism, casteism, and to see caste in light of race. I had been thinking about this for a long time. So I did a review about three or four years ago, soon after it came out of Isabella Wilkinson's book, Caste, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I just wanna read you a little bit of my review to show that even before I came to the book, I was already uh, sympathetic. Um, my worries go a bit deeper. 
other religions have been made foil to Christian and American virtue for a very long time. Hinduism has for a very long time been characterized by many in the West as deeply flawed on natural, moral, and religious grounds. While Wilkinson does not intend any crude reductionism, many people who read the book may come away with a sense that caste equals racism and caste equals Hinduism, which is almost to repeat what's in the book. Uh, this, to go on, would be a tragic mistake. We ought no more to think of Hinduism only as soiled by casteism than we ought to think of the United States only as soiled by racism or Christianity only as soiled by anti-Semitism. There is much more to be said as the Hindu traditions of over a billion people now flourishing everywhere in the world and affecting us all still have much to teach us by their intelligent, imaginative, deeply moral and spiritual ways of life. Cast that complex mix of structure, varna, birth status, jati, is part of a larger cultural and religious whole that we should not neglect, even if we point out some flaws. So I, I think you can see that what I'm saying is, is in the spirit of the book, if you've read that part of the book. But the, the chapter is then very thorough, and I, I, again, I'm commending it. Uh, <clears throat> the history of caste and social organization, and again, in a fairly abbreviated form, where does this notion of caste come from? How has caste been understood both traditionally, um, both in Vedic times, Upanishadic times, in the Bhagavad Gita and so on, um, and the complexities arising that resist any kind of simplistic interpretation. Uh, the complexity of caste in relationship to the Vanavasi people, people who are seemingly outside the system, what does it mean, does it mean in any traditional period to be a Shudra? Uh, how does that feature in caste and bhakti uh, is an issue. I mean, we all know that right back to the time of the Gita, the Charama Shloka, 1866, and through the Tamil bhakti saints and so on, uh, then Mirabai Kabir in the north and so on, the caste has always been under critique from the bhakti perspective, not perhaps in an absolute essential fashion all the time, but rather in the sense that caste can become mean-spirited and that it needs to be infused with bhakti and with a sense of love if the system is going to be tolerable. Uh, the, book, the chapter also considers the British and why and how the British became interested in caste. A uh, good section on Dr. Ambedkar and his understanding of caste, which is a very sophisticated, um, I think, take. I'm not an expert on Dr. Ambedkar, but nonetheless, it seemed to me a very interesting um, take. And therefore, one by the end of the chapter, one begins to see the pros and cons of caste, the history of the ca of caste, and the uses of caste um, in international affairs, and all the way leading up to book like Wilkerson's book, where a book about racism in America has the title caste, which is always an odd choice, I thought. I would comment that last spring, I taught a reading course um, in the college to three uh, very smart right um, freshmen in the college, three young women, friends from the dorms, one of whom had taken a course with me. And we did a course on caste. They wanted to learn about the caste system. And so we read some of the same texts. Uh, we read uh, books like Louis de Mont's Homo Hierarchicus, all the way up to a section of Wilkerson's book. And if I was teaching that course again, I would give this chapter to the students. In fact, if I do anything like that, I will do it again in the future. Because again, I think it stands up as a good chapter, I, I say that saying, you know, there are things that I would, you know, quibble with Rajiv about. Uh, some things seem to be needing in more explanation. Uh, the book refers to the old Abrahamic tradition of burning books and outlawing their usage. And there are horrible instances of that, but the, the Abrahamic traditions have also been great storehouses of learning and storehouses of preserving ancient knowledge, even what the Christians considered pagan knowledge was preserved. Not, so not, not everything was being burnt. Um, Gandhi is referred to, uh, I think the book is, is referring to a view about Gandhi as an appeaser of Muslims and supporter of their agenda outside of India. And I think that would seem to, something like that would need to be complexified. Um, Gandhi as an appeaser of Muslims and supporter of their agenda could be talked about, I think at length to get clear of what that means. And there's an uncommented on reference to Muslims' hatred of science. Um, and I think that too, because we know that much of the uh, science of the Greeks and of the ancient world was preserved through the Arabs. 
and much of Greek science and even Aristotle uh, reached the European world because Arabs prized it and saved it in Baghdad and other such centers of learning. And I mentioned those examples, not to say those are decisive in any way, but rather to say there's a lot we could talk about and to argue about. So to conclude, I have a few more comments and I'll be done. Um, I think you can see that I'm sympathetic to the book because I agree with a lot of it. Um, I'm not taking on certain parts of the book because I'm not the people involved in those parts of Harvard. But nonetheless, I think what I think, and this would be, I'm curious what Rajiv thinks, um, to be accusing him of being a theologian or an ethicist. Um, and some people would take that as fighting words. How dare you call me a theologian or an ethicist? But I mean it as a compliment, that there is a, a level of this book that richly takes seriously truth, takes seriously the transcendent, takes seriously traditions that people belong to, traditions of practice, and that arguably the book is a kind of apologetics. And apologetics doesn't mean simply polemic against your others, but entering into serious engagement and getting at some basic questions. And I take that to be a very uh, valuable part of what this book is about. Um, there's a beautiful passage on page 49. Um, I'm sorry, Roman numeral 49, so still in the introduction. <clears throat> uh, on, page, on Roman numeral 49, they say, we respond that rather than being the root cause of the problems dealt with here, the Vedic system holds the key to many solutions needed by humanity to survive. Ironically, Harvard is busy digesting the treasures of the Vedic system, the history of Indian science and technology, the science of yoga, meditation, vegetarianism, metaphysics, and alignment with nature, and turning these digested versions into their own intellectual property and that of the West. We want to do something different, I think is the purport of that, about taking, you know, not allowing the treasures of a tradition to be private property and not to write off traditions by finding something distasteful about them and saying, therefore, the traditions are not to be learned from, but rather saying that too often, very often, uh, the problems that are raised with religious traditions, the same sources have within them the solution to the problems that are raised. So one could do this with some of the prophets of Israel or some passages of the New Testament. The problems that are raised can be dealt with in part by going back to the same texts and saying there is a wisdom here that counters the awful way that it's been used in the past. So I would, you know, the proposal I have to close with, and I really will stop, um, and, and that this is both a proposal and a question for Rajiv and for the audience gathered here. Um, I would propose that perhaps serious Hindu intellectuals are talking to the wrong people when they talk to elite, powerful people at Harvard and other institutions that stand outside traditions and apparently have little interest in nurturing or respecting the traditions, insofar as that's true, that the Ivy Leagues and, and other wealthy American prominent institutions are often almost by definition today secular institutions. And I think there's a certain kind of religious, ethical, theological conversation going on in this book that would be better um, carried on with universities that respect ethics, respect theology, respect spirituality. And it, it sounds self-serving to say, therefore, turn to the Catholic universities. Uh, I think of places like Boston College, where I taught for 21 years, uh, University of Notre Dame, Georgetown University, where I think there would be, despite the complexities of these big institutions, uh, a, a deep resonance between the way Catholics perceive themselves as under pressure, often marginalized in American secular culture, and realizing that this is happening you know, very much the case in other parts of the world as well. And that instead of um, questing to, you know, challenge Harvard and get Harvard to do this or get Stanford to do that or get Princeton to do this, whatever, some of these other faith-oriented grounded institutions might actually be better conversation partners because East or West, many people of faith who are scholars and intellectuals would agree with many of the premises behind this book, and it would be a shame not to have that conversation as well. So with that notion and that idea, I conclude by again thanking Rajiv and Vijaya for the book, and hope that my comments have been helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.